Hey, everybody. Good morning and welcome. Hope you're doing well wherever you're at this morning. Uh, thanks for joining me on this Thursday morning, wherever you're watching from. We're uh, see you guys jumping on there, and and uh, it's uh, great to see you. I hope the morning's off to a great start. It's a beautiful change in weather here in Missouri. I think it's going to rain this week, but the uh, the sun is out and uh, spring is in the air, which is a nice change. Good morning, Valerie. Good to see you this morning. Good morning, Denise. Welcome. Here coming to you from my office this morning and uh, excited to talk about some interesting things today. Good morning, Alyssa, Tom, Doug. Hello to you all. Good morning, Steve. Good to see you this morning. Steve, I heard about your... Uh, I heard about your your incident. I think you you broke uh, broke your ankle or something like that, right? I'm praying for you, brother. I know that that's uh, wasn't expected. Certainly. Good morning. <laughs> ah, thunderstorms. They're coming, aren't they? Uh, with the tornadoes, maybe too. I remember the first time I heard that tornado siren after I moved to Missouri. I thought, what did I do? Uh, but we've been. So good. So far, so good, I think. <laughs> I hope you guys are doing great this morning. Um, good morning. Hey, Jordan, what's going on? <clears throat> hey, Michael. See you this morning. Hi, Mary. Welcome. Got a lot to cover this morning with you guys, uh, but before we jump into our, our main content here uh, this morning, I have a, a little bit of a bone to pick with somebody, and I don't know who, maybe it's not someone who's watching, but um, I gave a sermon analogy one time about, uh, and I, I used Twinkies as an example in my sermon analogy. And since that Sunday, someone has put a box of Twinkies at my office door every single week. I just need to let you guys know I don't like Twinkies that much. <laughs> I can't eat all the, I can't keep up. I can't keep up with all the Twinkies. Okay. So um, there are other things I like. There are other things I like too. Uh, car payments. I like car payments a lot. Um, I like uh, I like woodworking tools. Those are really great. <laughs> I'm just giving you guys a hard time. Um, the office uh, enjoys the Twinkies. So whoever's bringing me Twinkies, uh, thanks and no thanks. It's funny. It's funny. All right. Uh, this morning, you guys, we have uh, another You Asked segment. Um, been trying to put some of these together. And uh, I'm looking forward to tackling a question that came in uh, actually from one of our staff members who's watching. Uh, but also, over the years of pastoring, I've, I've been introduced to this question a lot. Um, and people have wondered about it. I've studied it uh, off and on throughout the years. And we're going to dive into this question this morning about the Enneagram. And uh, some of you might even be wondering, what on earth is the Enneagram? I've never heard of this. So hopefully, uh, if that's the case, this will be informative for you today. Um, if, if you do know what the Enneagram is, you, you have probably one of two views on it. Uh, you either think, A, that it's, it's kind of a fun, um, innocent uh, personality test 
that kind of shows you some interesting things uh, about yourself, or you um, feel pretty strongly that it's it's something Christians shouldn't be, um, you know, engaging in and partaking of um, because of its its roots and where it comes from. This morning, I'm going to try to give you guys a little bit of a, a history on what the Enneagram is, as well as my perspective biblically as to um, uh, how we should approach it as Christians. Now, before I get into any of this, I have to say that I, I am a bit amazed um, at how controversial this subject has become. Uh, and what amazes me even more is how some Christians have have taken the Enneagram and they've like almost ingrained it into their faith. Uh, if, if, if you are watching this morning and you, you would love the Enneagram and you're an Enneagram proponent, um, I'm just telling you up front, you'll probably be a little disappointed in some of the conclusions that I've come to regarding this, uh, regarding this subject. I'm just telling you that up front, but I hope you hear me out. Um, on this uh, as, as we go through a number of things that are, I think, relevant and important. But a, a, what needs to be said is that first and foremost, I think we can all agree on this. As Christians, we are called to operate our lives from a biblical basis, a biblical perspective. The Word of God is that which governs um, and, and defines who we are, how we live, what we view about ourselves and about God. That's our ultimate source of truth. And so we're going to be approaching this with that in mind, that, that our ultimate source of truth for life and God and ourselves is uh, the gospel narrative and the scripture. Um, as we look at this uh, idea of the Enneagram test, uh, the Enneagram model, should I say, um, those who like to take these tests would say something to the effect of, you know, it helps me understand myself and it helps us understand others a little bit better. It allows us to be more gracious to people or learn how to communicate with them in a way they understand. And I, I get that. I think that's a noble uh, goal to, to know each other and to know ourselves um, as we should. And I would even respond that, yeah, a, a test like the Enneagram could potentially reveal some things that we didn't know and, and help a little. There, there are some elements in it that come from, um, from, from science and from observation. But here's the bigger question is, is don't we already have a lens to look through um, by which we know ourselves better? Isn't the lens of the gospel and the word of God, what we really need to be looking at. And so that's kind of the goal we're going to aim towards that. Our goal as the scripture said is, is it says is not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds into the image of Christ. So we need to ask, does the Enneagram help us accomplish that? The Enneagram, the word Enneagram to uh, Greek roots that basically means a, a, a depiction or an image of nine. It's a, it's a, a gram, a, a pictogram of nine points. Uh, if you look at the, the symbol, it's, it's like a nine-sided star um, that basically uh, asserts that there are nine personality types, nine definitions of the kind of personality that you as a human being fall into within humanity and through a process of testing and self-discovery, you can, according to the Enneagram, come to know yourself in, in the most comprehensive and complete way. But the Enneagram, as, as many have come to find it or come to see it as like kind of a fun personality test, you know, Oh, I get to see some things about myself. It's, it's kind of funny because, um, I've never taken the Enneagram, but uh, people I've talked to who have taken it, they they say things like, wow, it was so it was so right on. It was so precise. It kind of told me exactly what I am. And and it and I kind of have to think, well, if you already know who you are, did you need that test to tell you that? Um, 
and so it is interesting though, is it more than that? Is it more than a, a kind of an innocent, fun personality test where we get to kind of laugh at, at the things about ourselves? I think it is. The Enneagram was not designed originally to be a personality test. It, it morphed into that. There are actually, uh, in, by the original author of the Enneagram, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, there's actually like 108 different nine pointed elements of humanity that is sought to bring people into a full self-knowledge awareness of themselves. But the Enneagram really is considered as a self-discovery tool. Um, let me show you guys this. Uh, this. This is a little clip from the Enneagram Institute. Let's see. Uh, just uh, Let's just read that real quick. We're told here, and this this is a a, um, a modern day uh, uh, morph of of the of of what the enneagrams morphed into in regards to the personality test. We're going to go back to its roots in a minute, but notice that he says here that the enneagram institute says here one of the most powerful and insightful tools, the enneagram, for understanding ourselves and others. At its core, the Enneagram helps us to see ourselves at a deeper, more objective level. And here, listen to this, and can be of invaluable assistance on our path to what? To self-knowledge. Now, I want you, the reason I, I pull that up is because the Enneagram really is a tool that is designed to lead a person on a journey to self-knowledge. Now, uh, we can see here, the actually i'm gonna i'm gonna save that slide for for uh upcoming point so i want to ask ourselves three questions here do we need the enneagram as a self-discovery tool as christians many christians don't and and myself included i had to really think through these questions don't stop to ask themselves i think three questions when it comes to tests like these want to ask ourselves, how did the Enneagram But let's ask ourselves, where did that, where is the baseline to determine per personality types? Where does that even come from? And what's the history of the Enneagram and, and where, how did it come to its modern version that most people see and take for granted in, in this time, this day. Now, the Enneagram has no official roots, right? It's rooted in, uh, in ancient Greek mythology, in, in uh, ancient Egypt, e Egyptology, um, and it's come through times. Certain aspects of the school of thought have been used in, in multiple societies throughout the ages in a, in a very humanistic pursuit of knowledge, secret knowledge. Uh, it's been used by mystics, these, these ideas, this nine, nine-fold, nine-star idea of the, how the hum, human psyche and soul and spirit is, is uh, designed to be. Um, it's been used all throughout history. But it was popular, popularized and formalized uh, as, we, as we more know it today in the 60s and 70s, specifically by a Boliv Bolivian philosopher by the name of Oscar Ocaso. Okay, Oscar Ocaso uh, went on this journey of self-discovery. He traveled to Asia um, and studied all various sorts of Eastern mysticism and Buddhism and Hinduism, and he he started studying all the mystical elements of different religions. Um, and as he went through his travels, he made his way back to Argentina, where he started um, what's called the the Arica School. Okay, the Eureka School is a school of knowledge and self-discovery, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but the Enneagram was birthed out of a school of thought and philosophies that Oscar Ocaso developed, uh, in which he maps out how the human being can achieve the highest plane of transcendent thought. So let's take a look at just some of this really quick. The Eureka School, I'm going to show you, I'm going to jump on the website here and show you this. Um, 
as we look at this, let me find it here. Okay. As we look here, the Eureka School, I want to point out just a couple things. The Eureka School, and this is where the Enneagram comes from. Let's read it, a little bit of it here. He says, uh, it comes from the, the schools of Hindu and Buddhist and Sufi traditions. Um, it's a complete, it offers a complete method of enlightenment, okay? And what makes the Eureka school different from the ancient schools is that it provi provides contemporary methods of enlightenment, employing biology, psychology, uh, physics, and modern knowledge in order to cl uh, clarify the human process for the attainment of freedom and liberation. So its goal here in this thought process is to free and liberate the human being to become enlightened, okay? And here's, here's a key part. Check this out. Um, what are the main questions that the school of thought that designed the Enneagram seeks to answer for the human being? Three questions. Number one, what is humankind? Number two, what is the supreme good of humanity? And number three, what is the truth that gives meaning and value to human life. And here we find further down from the point of view of the psychic process and maturity through the alignment, uh, attainment of and opening of the different states of being, the scarab, okay, which is the different spheres of knowledge uh, in uh, Arabic thought, can be experienced syst uh, systematically in its pre-established pre session. So, the idea is to go on a, a path of self-discovery through this process. You can answer the questions, what is humankind? What is the supreme good of humanity? And what uh, gives meaning and value to human life? Now, when we think of those, of those questions, okay, um, I think it's important to uh, realize that there is another source, isn't there? that answers these questions, that actually answers these questions with the most truthful, the most valuable answers. And of course, I'm talking about the gospel. The gospel conveyed in the word of God answers the questions, what is humankind? What is the supreme good of humanity? And what is the truth that gives meaning and value to human life? Um, these other schools of thought and philosophy try, are trying to answer these questions but the, 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 the questions are actually answered in the gospel. The gospel gives us the answer, right? What is humankind? Humankind are sinners by nature, alienated and separated in their heart and their mind from God, naturally depraved. What is, this good, what is the supreme good of humanity? That we were all created in the image of God to, to glorify him and enjoy him forever. And what is the truth that gives meaning and value to human life? That God came in the flesh Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to reconcile us to God, to conform us to the image of Christ, and to offer us eternal life with him forever. And so here's the thing. We need to start asking ourselves, what, what is this Enneagram really trying to accomplish? Is it, is it just a fun thing to tell me what kind of personality I have? Or is it coming from deeper roots that are spiritual in nature, trying to answer age-old human questions through other means other than the gospel, other than the word of God. And so when we look at this history here, it's, 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 uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit revealing. In fact, let's look at just a couple more of these things. As we, as we move down the line, um, we see the five tenets, and here's where I want to get here. The mantra of the Arika school. And here's what I want you to see. I don't know if that's big enough for you guys to see. Uh, let me see if I can maybe uh, make it even a little bigger here. Okay, let's try that. This model here, notice the mantra of the Arika school. The Tahum Kam Ra. That it represents the divine in each of us. Okay, so God is eternal, and we're not talking about the God of the Bible here, okay? God is in all of us. We're not talking about being made in the image of God. God is in everything, is one without second. So basically, we are all God. The divine is within us, okay? 
we are the divine. And so the more we discover ourselves, the more we discover God. Uh, and that's basically the main foundational elements of this. Okay. So let's, let's take a look at a couple other things. As we look at this Enneagram symbol, I want you to notice something here. With a clearly defined and complete map of the human psyche using Oscar's original Enneagram teachings, we have the basis to discover our entire ego process and to know how to, listen, transcend the lowest levels into the highest state of mind. This state is found in all of us and is available to each of us, the higher state of our awakened self and is experienced as a state filled with the great happiness, light, and liberation um, of, uh... <clears throat> so <laughs> think about this, you guys. This does, does this sound like uh, Christ-centered language? Does this sound like biblically grounded foundational elements of, of the kind of person or the kind of pursuit that the Christian is to give towards themselves and God. Of course it doesn't. It sounds like Buddhism. It sounds like Eastern mysticism. It sounds like Hinduism um, because that's where it all comes from. And we looked at this slide already. Um, and here are some of the different models of this nine starred nine, nine tiered uh, Enneagram. And so there's, like I said, there's a hundred, 108 of these that Oscar, this guy Oscar came up with. And it's supposed to let you know yourself and to come from your base state of mind to your higher awareness, to, uh, to complete enlightenment, okay? So as we look at this, let's ask ourselves yet another question. Um, given, the, given where it comes from, given what it's become, here's, the, here's another question we need to ask. Why does the Enneagram exist? And, and not only why does this exist, but as a Christian, do I really need a secular uh, personality test that's rooted in mysticism and the occult <laughs> to tell me who I am to help me know myself? Do I really need it? Um, I read an article by a pastor. His name is Tyler Zach. And I want to, I want to say it's state up front. I don't know Tyler. Um, the article he wrote was very thorough. It was very well written. He does come to the conclusions, you know, we need to make sure our life is centered in the gospel. So this is not a criticism specifically on him. I don't know him, but he does argue that the Enneagram can be helpful. Okay. in in, in knowing ourselves. and here's, here's what he writes. Um, and I quote, he says, the Enneagram is helpful because it makes general sins specific to us. I heard one pastor say that the Enneagram is useful for sniper sanctification. In other words, God can use the Enneagram to place crosshairs on some of the root sins and strategies in our life. Um, I fundamentally don't agree with that statement as, as a good reason to use or to do the Enneagram. And here's why. I suppose that God could use anything technically to reveal sin. I mean, he's God. He could use um, he could use the Book of Mormon to reveal that people are are sinners. That doesn't mean that we as Christians need to go read the Book of Mormon and try to discover if there's any truth in there for us um, that God wants to use to speak to us. Right? God can use a lot of things to reveal sin, but the the bigger question is: is do we need to pursue those other things when we have the Word of God? We have the Bible. We have the Gospel. We have the Holy Spirit. I want you to think in terms of what this looks like, right? Uh, John chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus said, uh, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. We're told that the uh, in Romans chapter 1, that the gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. What's the power of God? The gospel is the power of God. Um, I, I think of David's prayer uh, to the Lord, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What am I getting at? I'm getting at 
what exactly is the point of the Enneagram? Why do, you, why do we have to hold so, why do so many have to hold so tightly to it as though it's part of their faith or it's like ingrained part of now who they are and how they see themselves and how they define themselves? My friend, we already have the ultimate source of truth in God's word. We would be far better to spend our time praying and studying and meditating on the word of God. Oh, we, we should take heed to Psalm chapter one. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree firmly planted by the rivers of water, whose root and leaves shall not wither and, and shall bear fruit in its due season. See, we have already the word that tells us who we are. And the more that we seek and pursue Christ, the more we know about ourselves in a truthful way the more we know how we ought to become what we ought to become in order to be more loving and more understanding and and uh, and more compassionate uh, in our pursuit of others right I, I think there are a lot we have to be cautious why do we have to be so cautious because there are a lot of satanically influenced philosophies and humanistic philosophies in this world today that seek to draw the affection and the attention of the Christian. Um, I'm saying this as a shepherd, folks. I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings. I don't mean to, uh, I don't, I, and I'm not even suggesting, if you did the Enneagram, you're evil. If you did the Enneagram, you've opened yourself up to, to demonic influences. Hey, listen, a lot of people do this innocently, not knowing what it is. Uh, what I am suggesting, though, is that there is a better way. There is a better way. And it's the Bible. It's the word of God. It's pursuit of Christ in the power and in, in the mind uh, of the Holy Spirit who is in us, who is making us more like Jesus. A few other uh, passages. Here's what I want to point you towards. Um, let's put this all under the umbrella of Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, shall we? Let's put this all under the umbrella of Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Verses 6 through 10. Let me read it to you. Think of this. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Why? For in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And listen, you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. You guys, what does that scripture tell us? Notice, Paul says, we aren't on a journey of self-discovery. We are on a journey of becoming more like Christ, of Christ-likeness. We don't need to be made more aware of our man-made personality uh, types. What we need is we need, according to Paul, to be rooted and built up in Christ and the truths of the faith. Uh, here he tells us we need to be cautious and aware of philosophies that come from, quote, the traditions of men and the base principles of the world, recognizing that the ultimate outcome of those things that are under the influence of the enemy is to cheat us from what we could be and what we could discover in pursuing the mind of Christ. And then we're told that Christ himself is the fullness of God. And so when I seek to find myself in Christ, I become complete. I don't need, a, I don't need a, a test to tell me who I am. I don't need a self-assessment test rooted in, in, um, in ancient occult and mystic and Eastern mystic philosophies <laughs> to make me feel more complete about myself or, or, or give me a fuller understanding of myself. Uh, I am in Christ. In fact, Paul tells me in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. 
adopt the mind of Christ. Uh, listen to what, the, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. You know, the people, people without the Spirit of God, they look to these types of things because they're trying to discover themselves, and they're not receiving uh, the, the truth of Christ in their hearts and their minds. But notice what he continues. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Listen, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. That's a powerful thought. The mind of Christ. We have them. God has given us the mind of Christ. And so here again, I'm not trying to be a bully or a mean guy or some a weird, some uh, bring forth a strange conspiracy theory about this. I'm not trying to tie a bunch of symbols together. Um, simply straight from the facts. I showed you guys the websites. I didn't make those up. I didn't pull them from uh, from any um, uh, anti enneagram website. Those are just the the founding of the enneagram comes from these roots. It's morphed. Uh, it's it's brought in different personality types. It's become a business tool. I get all of that, but still, what is its main purpose? And do we really need it in order to accomplish that purpose? Or can we learn and know ourselves and God and each other by seeking to become more like Christ, by doing the hard work of digging deep into God's word, spending time in prayer, uh, repenting of my sin uh, that the Holy Spirit reveals to me and shows me as I continue on in life? Trust me, I don't need the Enneagram to put crosshairs on my sin. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about you guys. But um, I have, have had experiences up to this morning in which the Holy Spirit has reminded me, Josh, you are a sinner. Josh, you got to repent. Josh, you need to change the way you think on that. Josh, you need to change the way you live in that way. The Lord is always showing me those things if I'm staying close to him, if I'm staying in tune with him. When I think of this nine-sided star, it's interesting because um, this nine-sided Enneagram is actually been used in a lot of different um, uh, religions and uh, mystic thought throughout the ages. I mean, Baha'i uses this symbol, the religion of Baha'i, to um, represent the nine major religions of the world and how you can how you you can really find yourself if you adopt a little bit of this religion, a little bit of that religion, and you kind of put all the good things together. That's that you can achieve this enlightenment status. But I, I was thinking about this. And I thought nine, a nine-sided symbol, nine-sided symbol, the not the enneagram. It is a ripoff. It's a ripoff of. Well, let me ask you: Can anyone else think of nine attributes in the Bible that describe the kind of people God wants us to become? Nine attributes in the Bible that describe the kind of people God wants us to become: the fruit of the spirit. The fruit of the spirit is, is a nine-sided star, so to speak. You have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Maybe, maybe the test we ought to be asking ourselves is, how, do I, how am I doing in my love? How's my joy? Um, how much peace do I have in my life? How much kindness am I showing others? How much goodness am I demonstrating? Uh, how gentle am I in my responses? How faithful am I in my relationships and my walk with the Lord? How self-controlled am I in my emotions? I, I don't need a I don't need an enneagram test to tell me the kind of person I am, so I can know myself better. I, I, what I need to do is say, Jesus, I don't want to become more. I don't want to become my best self. I want to become like you. I want your love, joy, patience, kindness, peace, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control to manage my life. I think maybe, um, maybe sometimes we run to tests like that so that we can feel better about ourselves. When what we need is to let the Holy Spirit uh, invade the, the parts of our heart and minds that need to be changed. 
Now, do I think that we all have different personalities? Yeah, I'm not denying that, folks. I am not denying that. We all have different personalities. God has made us in his image, but he's imparted different personality traits to each of us. It is good that we sit down and really try to get to know each other, really ask ourselves the hard questions, really try to understand each other. But I think that we do more damage than good when we try to get to know ourselves and others through man-made philosophies or philosophies that, that have come through man's attempt to understand spirituality or understand God apart from Christ, what we need to do is we need to look at each other and ourselves through a biblical lens, through a biblical lens and saying, what does the scripture say about who I am, about what I need to become, about what I'm doing? And so uh, that is obviously not a, an incredibly, cons- com- I don't have time, we don't have time to do a fully comprehensive study uh, about where this comes from. But hopefully this gives you in a nutshell uh, what the Enneagram is. It's uh, um, where it came from, what its goals and intentions are uh, and, and what they were intended to be and how that can be in conflict with um, who God has called us to be in Christ and the truth he has given us in his word and the Holy Spirit he's placed within us. And so I I really challenge you to think about that, to pray about that, um, to do the hard work of digging into the scripture, of doing, saying, Lord, you test me, you search me, you know my heart, you show me who I am and who you want me to be, and let me have the mind of Christ. So there it is, folks. Uh, You asked, I tried to answer as best as I could, the Enneagram, um, Maybe I'll tell you what, you have some more questions that I didn't cover. You have some more insights, throw them there in the comments and I will come back to it and we'll hit this again uh, next Thursday and just try to answer any follow-up questions that there might be. But I have kept you guys long enough. I do hope and pray that you have a wonderful Thursday. In fact, why don't we close our time by praying together? Lord God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for that you know us better than we know ourselves. You formed us, Lord. You made us who we are. And what we need, Lord, is you to reveal those those plans, those purposes. I, I think about what Paul said. He said, we regard no man according to the flesh, but we see everyone as in Christ. And that's what we want to be, Lord. We want to be, we want to know who we are in Christ. And so, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit does that work in us to uh, help us see ourselves for who we are. Help us direct us into areas of our life that we need to repent and change and grow in in order to become more like you. And that's going to be the best for everyone, for our, our spouses, for our friends, our relationships, is that we become more like you, Lord. Um. And, and, and that's hard because it hurts sometimes to have you show us those areas of our life that we need to change. But we give it to you today, Lord, and we seek you. We seek your counsel, your word, your truth, and we pray that you guide us and lead us through this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Love you all and have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you later. Bye.